going to pick up where we left off last week. And uh, thank the good Lord we've got a good warm place to come to. Winter, winter has arrived. It took it till February, but it finally got here. <laughs> Father, we pray that you bless the study of your word now. Heavenly Father, we open the book and approach it, Lord, as your word, not the word of a man, but your word. And we pray that you'd speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, I want to, we stopped last week with the angel of the Lord, and uh, I brought a um, question before you before we finish the lesson that I wanted you to think about over the uh, uh, past week, and that is the uh, doctrine of the incarnation. Uh, when God appeared in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, for example, he appeared to uh, Abraham in the plains of Mamre right before he uh, uh, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He ate meat and uh, appeared as a man, and that was the angel of the Lord. He could take on flesh, appear in flesh, but he did not become flesh. That's the difference. With the incarnation, God literally became flesh, and he will never unbecome flesh. Amen. That's important to understand that part. Amen. That change is permanent. He became the God-man who will never be unbecome the God-man. To want of a better phrase, he will never cease to be what he is now. He will be that forever. Amen. And uh, that, of course, in itself would cause you to go home and do some thinking about it because of the great condescension that God made so that he would save us. Not only does he save us as the God-man, but we are saved in the God-man. And it's our position in him. And that's uh, where he becomes the last Adam, second man. That's important to understand that the incarnation is necessary, completely necessary, for God to save man. And uh, the, uh, the angel of the Lord was, is for, for the most part, an appearance of God. And he could appear in flesh. He could appear as fire. He could appear any way he pleases to appear. But uh, in my understanding of the word angel, and I did some digging this past week uh, once again to go back and see what some of the others had to say about it. Most of them simply say messenger. Uh, my understanding of an angel in Scripture is a manifestation, an appearance, whether as a messenger. Maybe it's a messenger, but it could be far more than simply a messenger. That's what an angel is. The angel of the Lord is a manifestation and an appearance of the Lord. And to be specific, it is an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament before he was incarnate 2,000 years ago in flesh. He sits now at the right hand of the Father and uh, nobody can define or the essence of the Father. You're wasting your time trying to do it because you'd have to define the essence of a spirit being and you can't do that. But we do know that uh, as the angel of the Lord, he appeared and now he's the God-man seated at the, power, at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Bible says the day is going to come when God is all in all Amen. that will be the day when we are able to comprehend probably the the greatness of the godhead uh manifested in spirit is, is as he is a spirit being that's all i can say as far as i can go because um, it just goes beyond it boggles my mind when i begin to think about it and i think about the fact is that's god and you can't break him down and uh, to our level to where he could be understood. I want you to turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse 7. Leviticus, Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is the handbook book of the priest. The priestly tribe was Levi. Notice the first four letters in the book of Leviticus. Levi. It is the handbook of Levi. Leviticus. 17, verse number 7. It's very instructive when you see the way these things are laid out in the Scripture. It's almost, after you've read the Bible for a while, it's almost as if there's a design in it. <laughs> Amen. It wasn't just thrown together, you know, bits and pieces and what have you. The Bible said in Leviticus 17, verse 7, And they shall no more offer their sacrifices, now look at this, unto devils after whom they have gone a-whoring. This shall be a statue forever unto them throughout their generations. Notice what it's connected with. Notice the devils, first time they show up in the Bible, are connected with what? Sacrifices. 
sacrifices, religious sins. All right? And notice it's in the plural, devils. And uh, some scholarship, uh, it's a hard thing sometimes to even recognize them as scholars when they make statements like this. But I've heard them say it time and time and time again. There's only one devil. See? They never quote scripture for that. They never give an authority for it. That's just their opinion that there's only one devil. Now, the word devil is not a name. See, that's not his name. His name is Satan, Lucifer. Devil is a generic term that has to do, if, for example, if you go into Greek, it's diablos. And if you go into Spanish, I think it's diablo. Rio Diablo is the river of the devil. All right. Diablos is a devil. It is, a, it is, a, it is an accuser. It is an adversary. It is a tormentor. But where in the world do you get the idea, this, this fanciful idea that there's only one devil? Any demon can be a devil, you see. So the idea to make a statement like there's only one devil, when the Bible clearly gives a, multi, gives a plurality to it, it says, unto devils. And if you'll notice, if you'll come over to the book of Revelation, chapter number 16. And this is uh, right, right smack in the middle of the tribulation period. The fact is, it's headed toward the end of it. In the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 14, Revelation 16, verse 14. Notice what your Bible says. If you look at verse number 13, it says, And I saw three unclean, what? Spirits, all right, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, verse 14, they are the spirits of what? And notice what they're doing. They're working miracles, all right? Devils in a, in a plural, in a, you have more than one, and they're, and they're working miracles. All right, let's go to that miracle. I'm going to tie the two together for you. Exodus chapter number 7 and verse number 9. Exodus 7, 9. When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, show a what? That's the first time it shows up in the Bible. Who's it associated with? Pharaoh. Who's the type of what? The Antichrist. Exactly. When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say to Aaron, Take thy rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Now, he was opposed by Janus and Jambres. This is what the New Testament says. If you'll notice, though, that a miracle, the miracle is something associated with the Antichrist. Now, is there anything wrong with miracles? Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with miracles. The Lord performed miracles while he was here. But the truth of the matter is, there's far more to God than what he can do. And some folks, that's the only thing they understand is what they can see, sense, feel, touch, smell, hear, some physical thing that they can, that they can, that they can, that they're conscious of, miracles. Well, thank God for miracles. I'd love to see a miracle of healing, salvation, all that. These are great miracles. They're wondrous things. But they're not designed, they're not an end in themselves. In other words, it's not just about miracles. To know God is not, is not to see that God can perform miracles. He spoke, His Word spoke universes into existence. It's Him. Amen. It's Him. It's the rise up above the food that you're eating and look at the one who's feeding you. Amen. The hog will never lift its head from the trough. It will eat that it will eat and eat and eat and eat. Step back for a moment and look up above you. There's a reason for this. There's a mind involved in this. There's a will involved in it. There's someone much, 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 much greater than us. You see, the Bible says in Revelation 13, now look at this thing carefully. Revelation 13, you notice chapter 16, it says that these are unclean spirits, right? Right? Now, you go, uh, go back to Revelation 13. And look at, uh, let's see, here it is, verse 14. Revelation 13, 14. The 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 14. Chapter 13, verse 14. <laughs> In verse number uh, 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by what? Miracles. See that? You see how easily people can be led astray by something that they can see, sense, feel, touch, smell, what have you? It impresses them. 
the miracles. Once again, I'm not against miracles. I'm not speaking bad. I'm simply showing you how that they can be used in a bad context. In a bad context. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, for example, John the Baptist, did he perform any miracles? Not a one, but he had, he had followers. When the Lord Jesus comes back, he comes back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? He's not really coming back to perform miracles. Amen. He's really coming back to manifest who he is. That's good enough. Amen. That really is. Just to find out who he is. He's coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So when devils show up in the Bible, it's associated with sacrifice, which has to do with in a religious context. And that's exactly where religion is, is today and where it's headed. It's worshiping of devils. He said the cup that we drink. We don't drink the cup of devils, do we? No, not the cup of devils, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first time that miracle shows up in the Bible, it show, it, uh, it's associated with Pharaoh. Now look at the book of Genesis, chapter number 49, verse 18. I think I covered this last week. Let's see if you remember what we did here. Genesis 49, 18, and I know I did now. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, see how many of you remember. Genesis 49, 18, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. How many of you remember what we talked about here? All right, and where is he? Salvation, salvation that Hebrew word is Yeshua. Okay, and that Yeshua is directly the counterpart of Jesus. Straight out of Hebrew into English. If I took Hebrew and went into English with it, I'd say Jesus. Of course, Jesus is the Greek name transferred over into our English, uh, Jesus. So Jesus is salvation. Verse number 18, O Lord, Jehovah. Okay, so the first time that salvation shows up in the Bible, it's associated with a name, Yeshua. Salvation. Does he save or is he Savior? Now, I know the Bible says he's able to save to the uttermost. I'll be preaching about that in a little while. He is, he is salvation. When Simeon held him in his hands, he said, Behold, I have seen thy salvation. That little baby in his hands. Just like he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't necessarily have to raise anyone. He is the resurrection, just his appearance. Nobody had ever died in his presence. Never happened. Nobody ever died in his presence. They will die when he comes as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How do you know? Because it says in the book of Isaiah, the blood will flow as high as a horse's bridle. In the 63rd chapter of Isaiah, it says the blood will be splattered all over his body, all over him. He's coming back as a man of war. He came as the lamb the first time. He comes as the lion the second time. Amen. The lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, John said. He comes the next time as the, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> Why did he come like that? Because of the time, the dispensation of time, the fullness of time. He came the first time to save, and he comes the second time to take by power what belongs to him. Because man will never offer it up freely. All right. So salvation. <clears throat> Look at Genesis chapter number 4 and verse 10. Here's the first time this shows up in the Bible. It's very interesting too. When you see, the way it's, when the, when you see what the Bible says about this. In Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number 10. Genesis 4.10. And he said, what, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brothers, what? Blood. Crieth unto me from the ground. Blood shows up in the scripture in Genesis chapter number 4 and verse 9. And the first time that blood shows up in the Bible in Genesis chapter number 4 and verse 9, it speaks. It has a voice. It speaks. Uh, let's see. Go to Hebrews chapter number 11. We'll have to find it here. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, and it's in the first four or five verses there. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 4. <clears throat> Hebrews, 4 <clears throat> Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith Abel, offered unto God a more excellent blood sacrifice 
sacrifice, blood. He offered unto God a more excellent blood sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of gifts, and by it he being dead, yet what? Speaketh. Speaketh. It's a testimony. Look at Acts chapter number 20 and verse 28. We need to see things like this because these are the kind of things that, that put to silence the heretics. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of what? Now watch the context, the antecedent of church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. All right, who's he? All right, does God have blood? God has blood. The church of God, see, didn't say the church of Jesus. If it had said the church of Jesus, you could say, well, it's talking about the church of Jesus. Jesus shed his blood. But the apostle Paul said the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Well, how could God have blood? It's the blood of Jesus, folks. And Revelation 1, 5, and all the new Bibles hate this verse. And here's the way they, I'll read it for you. First of all, I'll read it for you from the Bible. Then you can, uh, I'll show you in some of the ways that uh, they butcher it. Revelation 1, 5 said, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. See the word witness associated with blood? They're inseparable. Blood witness, witness blood, blood witness. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. See that? Yeah. And, of course, this blood right here, according to some of the, uh, started in the 1800s, I guess, uh, they say, well, this is his life. Blood only is representative of life. No, it's not. The blood is a literal thing because the blood speaks from the ground and testifies. When, when Abel died, his blood was testifying that there was a wrong, and that blood was associated with the ground. The ground was cursed, cursed. The blood associated with the ground. Notice how the Scripture brings this out when it talks about, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. On the tree he was cursed, and on the tree he shed his blood. It is the seal of God and marks where the curse is located by the shedding of blood. And the blood, therefore, becomes a witness and a testimony to God Almighty's testifying or to his estimation of what the earth is about. The earth is cursed, and the only way to do away with that curse is with the blood of one who is innocent. And he said, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. <clears throat> well, how in the world could that happen? I don't know how it could happen, but it happened. Amen. It happened. The blood of Jesus Christ is as surely real today and is present now at the right hand of the Father as it was 2,000 years ago when it was cursing through his veins. <clears throat> Absolutely. We have been washed in the blood. You've got that song over here time and again, washed in the blood. And liberalism High churchmen, people who are self-righteous and don't like this, they don't like this bloody religion. They like a religion of good works, blue blood, elite, uh, religion of, of self, of self uh, you know, self-improvement, self-gratification, uh, self all about self. They don't like this bloody religion. So in Revelation 1, 5, in the New Bibles, it said they loosed us from our sins instead of washed us from our sins. The difference is luo and lauo. It's been a while since I've looked up those two words, but they're close. Luo, it's uh, Lambda, Omicron, and Omega. And uh, the other one is Lauo, it's Lambda, Omicron, Upsilon, and Omega. Not big difference between the two words. But one means to loose, the other one means to wash. It's just like over there in 1 Timothy 3.16 with that controversy, great the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. Am I wrong? Of course I am. That's what the new Bible say. It says God. All right, in, 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 the, in the Greek text, it's theu, all right, God, theu, theos. 
It comes in many different forms. It's the declension of the verb and conjugate, uh, declension of nouns and conjugation of verbs that give you the different endings. But the, the Greek, the basic word you've heard is theos, okay? You've heard that time of theology. That's where you get that, the wisdom of God, study of God. They just change a word, a letter is all they have to change to make it from one place it says God and the other one says he who. A scribe can go in there and just change one little letter and the whole meaning has been changed. The Bible's consistent. This consistency goes all the way back to Moses when he wrote the book of Genesis or Leviticus and goes all the way through the book of Revelation. Why is it consistent? Because it's got one author. Amen. That's why. All right. Now I want you to go on with me to the book of uh, Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 5. Exodus 3, 5. Now, this is a familiar place for you, the burning bush. And it said here, I draw nigh, draw, draw not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is righteous moral ground. Did I mess up? That's the way they interpret it. Not because that's the way they interpret the word holy. What did it say in the Bible? Holy ground. Hadn't God already put a curse on the ground? He certainly had. Yet he called it holy. Do you remember when they went into Jericho? Jericho was an accursed city. Cursed is the man who rebuilds Jericho. He will, it. he will rebuild it in the blood of his firstborn. And yet he said, it is holy unto me. So what does that word holy mean then? It, that's exactly what it means. It means this claim of ownership. It may be righteous and it may be moral, but it may be wicked and ungodly. But it is the claim of ownership that belongs only unto him. It is his sovereign possession. So holiness in the Lord means that I am unto myself. I am who I am. I am not possessed by anyone else. I reside where I reside. I am holy, holy, holy. Or if I lay claim on something and say it is mine, it is mine. There's no argument about it. It's finished, done with, it's over. And that's what he means by holy. Holy angels, they belong to me. Holy ground, that's my ground. That's what, that mean, that's what the word holy means. Now if you notice, the first time it shows up in the Bible, it does, has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with righteousness. It has to do with God speaking to a man in Midian that had been there for 40 years. Uh, tending the, to the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. And uh, he spoke to him and got his attention because he saw a bush burn. It wasn't consumed. Yeah. That bush burning and yet not being consumed is a picture of somebody. They burn, yet they're never consumed. They're called the ancient people. They're here from everlasting to everlasting. You're about to see a conflagration take place, probably unprecedented on this earth because it depends. There's a lot of potential for this thing to get way out of hand because Israel is about to bomb Iran. They will destroy their nuclear capabilities. And I don't know if this is what Obama wants or I don't know if Obama's going to use it against Israel. The only thing we can do now is observe and see what's going to happen. But Israel has tried to deal with the United States for months to, you know, to hopefully to get the United States to do this. And it appears that our current president is not willing to do anything against the Arabs. And, and of course, Iran's not Arab. They're Muslim, but they're Persian. But, he, but they're still Muslims. So he's not going to do, apparently he's not going to do anything to, to, to disrupt, uh, you know, his relationship with them. So it's going to fall to Israel to do this. And it could be that he's, he may be setting a trap for Israel. Obama may be. Don't trust this man. Amen. But Israel, Krauthammer said yesterday or the day before, Charles Krauthammer said, he said that Israel, the nation of Israel, was formed because of the Holocaust, a place for the Jews to go to to have a homeland. And he says they will not let Iran have nuclear capability 
He said they did not go to that country to form a country, to, to have a country to protect them and then turn around and invite total destruction. Amen. And he's exactly right. And he says that when the next, within, uh, I think he said, well, March or April, within, by, by March or April, and of course, this is, you know, speculation. It could be next week. It could be tomorrow. It could be this evening. It could be at any time. When Israel strikes, they'll choose the time. Amen. They'll choose the place. They'll choose the method. And they will strike. When, uh, when Khrushchev put those missiles down there 90 miles off the coast of Florida in Cuba, John Fitzgerald Kennedy let him know with no uncertain terms, says we may go into a nuclear war, but you will take those things out. You will move them from Cuba. All right, what's the difference in the United States and Israel? If the United States was threatened by, by these things in Cuba, 90 miles off the coast, then Israel has just as much right to, uh, to do away with their enemy over there with Iran Amen. and destroy their nuclear capability. But the problem is that it may escalate into something big and it may be the, it may be the venue for the Antichrist to step up and take his reins. And you know, if you don't know the truth from me, I hope it is. <laughs> um, really, because that means that he's going to come back and he's coming back soon and we're going out of here and hallelujah. And I'll see you on the corner of Hallelujah Street and Glory Avenue. Amen. <laughs> As we leave out of this place and go on to be with the Lord. Let them fight for it. <laughs> they can have it. <laughs> they can have it for seven years. At the end of seven years, the Lord's going to say, it's time to go back, boys. And so back we come. And when we come back, we come back in war. All right. So uh, uh, holy is unto him. Now, don't you look at Daniel chapter number 10, verse uh, 21. Daniel 10, 21. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter number 10, <clears throat> and verse number 21. Why don't you look at this carefully now? Lord said, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Now, who is Michael? Let's find out right now. Who is Michael? Is he the Lord Jesus Christ? No. <laughs> a lot of them out there teaching that. But I don't believe it for a minute. Michael is an angel. And uh, an archangel, for that matter, a, a, a ruler, ruling angel, princely angel, a supreme angel, great angel, and uh, Gabriel. But notice it says here in verse number 21, which is noted in the scripture of truth. Scripture. All right. Now, the English word scripture comes from script, which simply means to write. All right. And so the scripture is a reference to one body of truth. On the face of this earth, I do not recognize anything else in Scripture except the 66 books of the Holy Bible. Now, I want you to look at the book of Galatians, chapter number 3. And here's a very interesting thing that's said about the Scripture. Look at verse number 7, Galatians 3, 7. Galatians 3, 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. All right? Okay, now watch this, verse 8. This locating it. I'm locating, this is, this is chronology. I'm locating the time here for you. Look at verse 8. And the scripture, now watch this, foreseeing, what's that? Prophesying, looking alive, that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, 1900 B.C., saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, what do you do with that? There wasn't any scripture written. Possibly Job, you know, as I've said, we, nobody can nail down exactly when Job was written. And uh, if Moses wrote it, we don't know who wrote it, but if Moses wrote it, he couldn't have written it before 1400 B.C. And he was writing of something that happened 500 years before that. So it had to be handed down to him and kept alive in, in Israel. But in any event, Moses had not written Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There was no written scripture. Yet the Bible says the scripture existed. And it was looking. It was foreseeing. It was prophesying. It's almost like it was alive. <laughs> a 
Okay. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 12, the word of God is quick. It's alive. Now, I don't want to get too scary with you, but that thing you're holding in your hand right there is alive. <laughs> it is. This is alive. Before it was ever written down, it was spoken. Before it was ever spoken, it was in the heart and mind of God. The eternal word, the eternal word, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Then he said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that? That's the Lord Jesus. All right. The word was with God and the word was God. See how the scripture alive existed as far back as God has existed when the plan of words forever. What does that mean? That means that the day you were born was simply a fulfillment of of the scripture foreseeing that you would come into the world in eternity past. That in the mind and heart of God you have always been. Because there is impossible for anything to come into existence that takes God, uh, catches him off guard. Amen. That he learns. The only thing that he has ever learned, and he learned it experientially, is when God became man and suffered. He had never felt suffering. He had never felt pain. He had never felt hunger. He knew exactly what pain, suffering, and hunger was. But in order for him to feel it experientially, he had to experience it. He had to be a man to experience it. And that is, of course, the God-man. So therefore, how far back do you go? Calvin, his five, uh, his five insane points of total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and predestination teaches that you are chosen, that you are the chosen ones, that because you are chosen, because he knew you and he ordained you before the foundation of the world to be saved, all right? All right, he's only done a certain number that like that. That's it. That means that in eternity past, before you ever were, before any human ever existed, God had already ordained for you to burn in hell before he ever made hell. He had ordained for you to burn in hell forever. That's Calvin's insanity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I've searched out ordination, things that were foreordained. Yeah. 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 Before. Nothing else is said to have been foreordained before the foundation of the world but that. All right. All right. Now. Between a decree and to foresee. Oh, yeah. Vast difference. Vast difference. Foresee is to be cognizant of, to know. But to decree something means that God's going to bring it into existence. He says it's going to happen, and it will happen. But all of this right now, all of these things that I'm talking to you about right now, are the kind of things that really make you begin to think. Really begin to think. You didn't come into existence when you were born in 1946. You didn't come into existence when you were born. You have been in the mind of God from eternity. He said, before I formed thee in Jeremiah chapter number one, I knew thee. Amen. Right? And ordained thee to be a prophet to the nations. Right? He knew him before he was ever born. He knew him. Knew who? <laughs> the baby or Jeremiah the man? He knew all these things. And this is the foreknowledge of God. And it's one of these things that literally blow your mind. But if he's God, he's capable of everything. He has no limitations. The only limitation that God knows is the one he places on himself. And he can do that. He can choose not to know certain things. And I'm thankful for that. For example, he can cast your sins as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. He wipes them out. Whereas he could remember them forever. All right. So the scripture, the word, this is book is alive. That's why it still talks to us. Because it's a living word. 
All right, now, here's a good one. Genesis 9, verse 21. First time it shows up in the Bible. <clears throat> Genesis 9, 21. Look at verse 20. And Noah began to be an husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine. And was what? So the first time the word wine shows up in the Bible, it's associated with what? Drunk. And the Bible has nothing good to say about a drunk. So how's the Bible cast wine? Puts it in a negative context <laughs> from, uh, from uh, cover to cover. It's something to, to shun, leave alone, stay away from. You won't control it. It'll control you. All right. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter number 32 and verse 22. Deuteronomy 32 verse 22. Deuteronomos. Second giving of the law. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. Deuteronomy uh, 32, 22. For fire is kindled in mine anger. Now that's an issue right there, but we won't deal with that right now. A fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest what? Hell. You see that? And shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundation of the mountains. Here the Lord mentions hell for the first time in the Bible. And you'll notice it's associated with what? The anger and wrath of God. Uh, it's, it's irrelevant to where the location is because it's going to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone eventually. But I believe it's in the heart of the earth. I believe it is. I believe that's where it is. And uh, hell is definitely a place. And it's a place that uh, the scripture talks about it all through the Bible. But it's a place that you don't want to go to. Amen. And the worst, as I've said before, the worst uh, uh, tragedy of hell is the fact that you don't have to go there. Amen. When Christ went to the cross and died on the cross, he died to keep you out of hell. Amen. And he died for all men, tasted death for every man, to keep all men out of hell. Not just Calvin's elect and elite but every man. The Bible said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto earth us the word of reconciliation. He was in him on the cross dying for all of men. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the elite, the elect, the world. All right, now look at the next one here. Deuteronomy 32 verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter number 32 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what therein shall be, for they are a very froward generation. That's today. What is that? Presumptuous. Children in whom is no, there's the first time it shows up in the Bible, faith. All right. Faith. Cometh by what? It comes by the word of God. That living word that's alive plants a seed that's alive in your body. A seed that must die and then bring forth fruit. All right. It, in other words, it, it, it literally transforms itself into life-giving faith. The faith, if you ever have faith to believe, believing faith, believing faith comes by receiving what you've heard of the word of God. Receive the engrafted word able to save your soul. God does not call upon you to produce believing faith if you've never heard the gospel, if you've never been convicted of the gospel, if you don't have a clue who the Lord Jesus Christ is, if you know none of these things, how in the world are you going to have faith? And no man can come to me, he said in John 6, except the Father which hath sent me draw him. That drawing is that working of the Holy Spirit through his word to produce in you saving faith if you don't fight him. Because the word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, the word of faith which we preach. It's in the heart of a man when he hears the good news of the gospel, he really does want to believe that. 
But there's a lot of reasons why he won't believe it. Well, it's not for me, or I can't change, or, or a better day, or something else. And he'll make excuses, and when he does that, that word that he had received literally just fades out dies away from his soul and then he can't just choose that well I think I'll get saved today this would be a good day to get saved you know some soul winner goes up to him and says one two three believe after me and you're going to be okay and you can fill your church up with people like that and the pulpits are full of preachers like that that didn't have any more salvation than that and I get a lot of criticism from people and I got a very severe criticism the other day through our prayer page from one woman a mother blaming me for the breakup of her home, of her, of her son's marriage, because that I would not give him assurance of his salvation. I never have, and I never will give you assurance of your salvation. That's not my place. That's not my place. That's not my place. And I've been accused of uh, trying to make salvation too hard. No, I'm not. I want to make it real for you. If you ever really truly born again by the grace of God, you don't need anybody. I don't, there's no preacher going to get up in the pulpit and tell me if I'm saved or lost. I couldn't care less what he has to say about it. I know what happened to me in 1973. I was drawn by the Spirit of God and convicted and converted. And that's what has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, all in the world you do, all you are doing is contributing to their damnation and their downfall. What an arrogant person to step in and say, I know you're saved. You don't know, you don't know anything. There's only one who can read the heart. Just one, just one, just one. And uh, I pray that we observe each other in the fruit that we bear. But that matter of salvation, boy, my, 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 faith. Hmm. All right. I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis 22, verse 5. Fundamentalists have been horrible about posting all of the saved that they've had this past year. We baptized 1,050. There's one church I've heard of that, uh, that uh, they've got 2,000 people in the town and they've had 15,000 people saved in the last five years. <laughs> I thought, what in the world's going on here? How'd they do that? <clears throat> anyway, I'm just, uh, I'm really blowing it a little bit out of proportion, but the truth is that that's about so in some cases. Genesis 22 and verse number 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. First time it shows up in the Bible. Where does it show up? That's very instructive. It really is. Where does it show up? It doesn't show up in a church house. It's not a synagogue. It's not a place of worship. When you say, what is a place of worship? Anywhere you put your foot Amen. is holy ground. Holy unto the Lord. And you can worship. Abraham was worshiping by taking his son Isaac to the top of that mountain, offering him to a sacrifice unto God. Isn't it amazing how the things in the Bible are so different from, uh, from the accepted, generally accepted uh, explanation that we get today let me say this to you and I'll close most of what's taught in the churches most of it most of what's taught in the churches about anything is all designed with one purpose and goal with one goal in mind what's that to fill that church up and to get money out of your pocket and put it in that plate Amen. that's what it's designed for they couldn't care less about the truth that's all they're interested in and that's why that you'll hear some churches harp and harp and harp and harp and harp and harp and harp about certain things. It's because that's their agenda. It's a sad, it's a sad thing when a church has an agenda. Amen. It really is. Our reason for being here is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's why we're here. And if he is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. And that's why this preacher's in the ministry and that's why we're in here today. If we'll lift up the Lord Jesus, you'll see men starve to death and hungry for reality and the truth where somebody's not trying to milk them from every dime they got in their pocket and you'll see them saved. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go now. Brother uh, Caleb Wilson dismisses.